This is a GCSE chemistry tutorial within topic 8. In this video we will be looking over separation techniques. In this tutorial we will look at defining and demonstrating an understanding of miscible and immiscible liquids. We will look at how we can separate immiscible and miscible liquids. And we will look at how to calculate the RF values of a chemical when carrying out paper chromatography. A popular examination question is to look at how to separate a mixture of salt and sand. It will ask for both of these, both the salt and the sand, to be dry and usable at the end of the experiment. In order to separate salt and sand, we need to take advantage of the fact that salt will dissolve into water, whereas sand will not. So we make up a solution of our salt and sand with 50 centimetres cubed of water. This will mean that all of the salt dissolves, but the sand does not. We can then use filtration in order to separate this out. Using a filter funnel and filter paper, we can collect the sand whilst the salt solution passes through the filter. We can then dry this sand to get our pure sample. Taking this salt solution, we then pop this into an evaporating basin to heat above a Bunsen. Heating the salt solution will evaporate off the liquid. We heat it above a Bunsen until almost all the water has evaporated before popping it on a windowsill in order for the rest of the water to evaporate. This will leave us with salt crystals as this is a form of crystallisation. We now have our pure dry salt and our pure dry sand that have been separated successfully from each other. Filtration and crystallisation are the first method that we can use as a separation technique. We will look at it in a bit more detail in a second. The other two methods we're going to look at are distillation or fractional distillation and paper chromatography. As we saw in our example of salt and sand, filtration allows us to separate a solid from a liquid using filter paper. The filtrate will then carry on through, that's our liquid part, and the solid, the residue, will stay behind. We can then dry this solid in order to get a pure dry sample. Crystallisation also allows us to remove a solid from a liquid, but in this case it's when the solid is dissolved in water. We then evaporate off the water and allow the crystals to appear. We can see crystallisation of salt crystals here. This happens because we gradually evaporate off the liquid, making the solution into a saturated solution. The solute will then begin to crystallise. As we continue to heat off the water, we will get more and more crystals appearing. The slower that we heat off the water, the larger the crystals will be. The use of crystallisation and filtration takes advantage of the idea of miscible and immiscible. A miscible solution is when all of the components are mixed together, for example water and ethanol or salt and water. However, by contrast, some substances are immiscible. This is when they do not mix to form a solution. For example, with oil and water. We will now move on to look at distillation, which is when we are going to separate out two miscible liquids. Distillation allows us to separate a pure liquid from a mixture of liquids or we may have a solid present as well, as we do here with seawater. It works because the liquids have different boiling points. If we are separating two liquids, this is known as simple distillation. In order to carry out simple distillation, we heat the solution and then the part of the solution that has the lowest boiling point will evaporate first. This evaporated liquid, this gas, will travel up and into the condenser. The condenser is kept cool by a constant supply of cold water in order to allow this area to remain cold. The condenser then causes the vapour to condense, cool back down, into a liquid. This pure liquid can then be collected here. Unfortunately, simple distillation only allows us to separate out things that have very different boiling points. 
So if the temperature goes higher than the boiling point of the substance with the higher boiling point, they'll just mix up again. We have to keep it above the boiling point of the first liquid, but below the boiling point of the second. If we have a mixture of liquids with similar boiling points, then we need to use a different method, and that method is fractional distillation. Distillation overall, be it simple or fractional, works in this order. So we will heat our liquids, evaporating one of them, which will then be cooled and made to condense, so we can separate out our two liquids. Our example here, we are distilling pure water from our salt water. We would end up with salt left in the flask here, and pure water would be distilled off. We can also do this to distill pure water and ethanol. Ethanol has a lower boiling point, so it will evaporate first before being condensed and then ending up with pure ethanol in our flask here, and pure water would be left in our original round bottom flask. As we mentioned on the previous slide, fractional distillation allows us to separate out a mixture of liquids or liquids that have very similar boiling points. We've looked at fractional distillation before in the fractional distillation of crude oil, which is in the alkanes and alkenes video. In fractional distillation, we would put our mixture into a flask and stick a fractionating column on top of it. The different liquids have different boiling points, so they evaporate at different temperatures. The liquid which has the lowest boiling point will evaporate first. Therefore, we will be able to take this off and condense it. Liquids with higher boiling points will also start to evaporate, but at this point the column is cooler towards the top, so they only get part of the way up before condensing and heading back down towards the flask. When the first liquid has been collected, we then raise the temperature until we can condense our second fraction. We can then collect each fraction in turn in order to separate out our mixture. Our final separation technique is paper chromatography. Chromatography can be used to separate mixtures of coloured compounds. Mixtures that are suitable for separation by chromatography include inks, dyes and colouring agents that we find in food. Chromatography can be used for a wide variety of uses. It can be used to find what additives might be in food. It can be used in forensics. It can be used to look at drugs and alcohol that might be in someone's system after they've been arrested. We can use it to look at water samples for pollution. It can be even used to detect bombs in airports. We can also look at things like fingerprinting, again linking in to forensic science. So how does paper chromatography work? Well, chromatography lets us separate inks and dyes according to the size of the particle. In chromatography, we have two phases. These are the mobile phase, which is when the molecules can move, and the stationary phase, when the molecules can't move. During a chromatography, the substances in the sample move between the mobile and the stationary phase, and an equilibrium is formed between these two phases. The mobile phase moves through the stationary phase, and as it does so, anything that dissolves in the mobile phase will move up. With it. So as this water, which is our solvent, travels upwards, the substance gets dissolved and it will travel upwards. How far a chemical moves depends on how it's distributed between the two phases. If the substance is more attracted to the mobile phase, then it will move further. If it is more attracted to the stationary phase, then it won't move as far. This also depends on their size, as particles which are larger will be more attracted to the stationary phase and particles which are smaller will be more attracted to the mobile phase. Finally, the solubility of the molecule in the solvent will also make a difference. The higher the solubility, the further they will travel in the mobile phase. This allows us to identify a pure substance from a mixture, as a pure substance will only produce one spot on the paper chromatography paper, whereas a mixture will produce multiple spots.
However, a mixture may produce a different number of spots depending on the solvent, as this will change the solubility of different components that make up the sample. Importantly, we need to be able to calculate stuff from paper chromatography. This involves the calculation of a retention factor or an RF value. This allows us to compare the components of various samples. The RF values can then be compared with known RF values for other chemicals. In order to do this, we need to be able to correctly look and identify a chromatography paper. On our chromatography paper, we have our baseline. This is the point where the chemicals start. This baseline must be drawn in pencil as if it was drawn in ink, the ink would dissolve into the liquid and therefore would interfere with our results. As we've seen, this solvent then travels up through the paper chromatography paper. At the top, this is known as the solvent front. This is the point at which the water stopped moving up the paper. So if you were carrying out a chromatography, you would stop it just before the solvent reaches the very top of the paper. And then finally, we have our spots. This is the point at which a band or spot of colour is found. So we've got our baseline, our solvent front, and our spot. This allows us to calculate the RF value, as we can work out the distance from the baseline to the spot, so the distance travelled by the substance, and then we can divide it from the distance from the baseline to the solvent front, which is the distance travelled by the solvent. So overall, we've got RF equals the distance travelled by the substance over the distance travelled by the solvent. This end pattern is known as a chromatogram. Here we have two images showing us two different parts that we need to know. The first is how to set up our chromatography experiment. We can see our chromatogram paper, we can see our solvent front and our solvent, and we should be able to see the starting line. We can see that the different substances have travelled up. We usually put a lid on top of our chromatography experiment to prevent any of the solvent becoming evaporated. On the right, we have a sample chromatogram. We can see our origin point, our starting line, where we have our baseline value, and we have our solvent front. We've been given a value that the distance travelled by the solvent is 10 centimetres. In the exam, this diagram may or may not be to scale. If it is not to scale, it will tell you the distances that the solvent has travelled and each substance has travelled. If it is to scale, then you need to get out a ruler and directly measure these. From this chromatogram, we've been told that the purple spot has travelled 6 centimetres from the baseline. Therefore, we can calculate the RF value, the retention factor value, for the purple chemical. To do this, we will do the distance travelled by the substance, which is 6 centimetres, and divide it by the distance travelled by the solvent, which was 10 centimetres. This gives us an answer for the RF value for the purple spot of 0.6. I want you to pause the video here and work out the RF values for the blue spot and the red spot. You should have found that the blue dot has an RF factor of 0.8, 8 divided by 10, and the RF value for the red spot should be 0.2, 2 divided by 10. From this, we can see that the red spot has travelled the shortest distance, so it was the least attracted to the mobile phase, but the most attracted to the stationary phase. It was the least soluble and was the largest. The blue one, on the other hand, has the highest attraction to the mobile phase, the smallest attraction to the stationary phase, and has travelled the furthest. It is the most soluble and the smallest particle here. RF values are always between 0 and 1. If you get an RF value of 1.0, this means that the spot has travelled all the way up to the top of the solvent front, whereas an RF value of 0 would mean that the substance hasn't moved at all.
With these RF values, we'd be able to compare them to a table of known RF values to work out what these chemicals might be. We could also compare this to RF values for pure substances in order to work out which pure substances are found in our mixture.